Good morning, everybody. I see people are still arriving, and so I want to welcome you all today. While you're uh, finding your seats, I'll just introduce myself and welcome you to CU Boulder and to the Colt Conference. I'm Daryl Maeda. I'm Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education here at the University of Colorado Boulder and also a uh, a professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna give a little self plug. If any of you are fans of the martial artist and movie star, Bruce Lee, I've just published a cultural history of him. It's coming out on August 9. It's called Like Water, A Cultural History of Bruce Lee. This has zero to do with Colt. So, I apologize for a little self-promotion, but I want to say welcome to all of you to Colt 2022. Um, I want to uh, say that I'm thrilled to have you here at CU Boulder, no matter whether you've traveled from near or far. And the reason why I'm so excited to have you here is that you are the innovators. You are the cutting edge thinkers, the movers, the shakers, the doers who are going to lead us into the next epoch of education. Now. You know, the first epoch of education was very small, very customized, very personal. It was a blacksmith teaching an apprentice how to melt iron, pour it into molds, and quench it in, in cold water. It was uh, an abbot teaching uh, a monk to read, to write, to copy manuscripts with quills and pens. Before that, it was parents taking children into the forest to gather fruits and nuts and to know which berries were the ones that were good to eat and the ones that would make you violently ill. But the point here is that, that I'm making is that in each case, we had a teacher and a student or a small group of students interacting in ways that were intimate, that were interactive, and that were tailored to maximize learning. Now, in the second epoch of education, we saw rapid growth, right? We think of things like uh, the GI Bill and post-World War II education, a rapidly growing and rapidly complexifying society put demands on higher education that we had never seen before, right? We saw the growth of large universities where students took classes in large numbers, uh, how many of you took chemistry or calculus or history or something in a large classroom with hundreds of, of your cohorts? Yeah, I know, I did too. Or I should have said, or even aeronautical engineering, given where we are. Um, during, this, uh, during this second epoch, right, we had this industrial model of education that combined, that, that really uh, leveraged scale at the cost of the deeply personal nature of education, which is why I think that you are here to lead us into the third epoch of education where we leverage both scale and personalization and use technology as the tool by which we do that. Technology is the tool that we use to uh, create bespoke experiences for students. It's the means by which we can return to active learning, although at scale, it's what will enable us to return to the principles of student-centered education that we began with. So I just wanna tell you, I'm not an ed tech person, I'm not an expert, I'm not a developer, I'm not an entrepreneur, and I'm not an evangelist, but I am a person who has a vision of higher education, one that is rooted in equity and justice. I believe, and I am 100% positive that every single one of you agrees with me. I believe that higher education is the key to building a just, a sustainable, and a democratic society. So the second epoch of education opened doors for countless people who would have never been able to attend college before, but we have so much more work to do. We have so many more doors to open for people who still remain locked out of our halls of learning. 
leveraging the power of modern technology is one critical intervention that can help us to build the university that is so desperately needed for the 21st century. Technology driving us to a world in which higher education is more equitable and accessible, that's what I'm here for today. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome you to Colt 2022. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome, very inspirational. I think we'll, we, we can all take forward with that. For this moment, I'll just introduce myself quickly. I'm Janice Thorpe and I'm the faculty program chair for CALT here and you'll hear more from me later and the team that I get to wonderfully work with. But for now, I'm gonna spend my two minutes introducing our keynote speaker. If you have not uh, read uh, her bio on the website, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a glimpse here. We are in for a treat, let me just put it that way. Dr. Michelle Miller, our keynote speaker, is a professor of psychological sciences and the president's distinguished teaching fellow at Northern Arizona University. She is the author of Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology, which came out in 2014. And her new book, Orange, just like the Colt t-shirts today, how timely. Her newest book is Remembering and Forgetting in the Age of Technology, Teaching, Learning, and the Science of Memory in a Wired World. And I, for one, am very intrigued to hear more about this. I'm sure you've had some students to say, why do we need to memorize anything? We can just look it up. But she's going to tell us why that's important. And uh, this book came out uh, in April of this year. And if you want a copy and there is a discount code, you should have seen it when you registered for the conference. If you don't have it, um, check with us. Dr. Miller completed her PhD in cognitive psychology and behavioral neuroscience at UCLA, and her research interests include memory, attention, and the impact of technology on learning and on the mind. And hot off the press, just yesterday, she has had an article come out in the Chronicle of Higher Education titled, Ungrading Light, Four Simple Ways to Ease the Spotlight Off of Points. So we'll all be checking that article out, I'm sure too, which will cover, that article covers some of the same techniques that she'll cover in tomorrow's workshop. So I'll point you to that, um, which could be really useful for faculty who are maybe now thinking about the, creating their syllabus and, and how can I set those points up more equitably. Later on this afternoon, I also want to point out she has an FAQ session. We're not going to take questions directly here. She's going to actually ask you questions first. But if you have questions for her, you could come to the session later this afternoon. Um, and then without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Miller. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction and for all of you for, for being here today. So we're here to talk about teaching, about learning, about all the intersections with technology. And it's just such an honor and a pleasure to, to be able to do that in, in person and in, and in the virtual modality. So as you picked up from the introduction, I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, all right? That's always shaped my, my approach to everything I do in my career. Um, and so early on in my career, I was working on really theoretical inside baseball, baseball kind of stuff, uh, studies of memory, attention, language, and so on. But then I came to work at an institution that deeply prizes and cares about teaching, Northern Arizona University. And so it was really natural for me to, to start kind of rotating and turning my career and my focus towards a different applied question, how we can take the findings from cognitive psychology, from the study of how people think and remember and reason, and other associated sciences and fields, other areas of psychology, neuroscience, and so on, and put those in the hands of people who are on the leading edge of higher learning today. So people like people who take out a, a wonderful afternoon <laughs> on a beautiful summer day and come to a conference like this one. So I think that, that we're all in that together. And you know, this idea of bringing psychology to, to teaching and learning is not a new one, right? A lot of people have called for this throughout the years, but I find that even today, so much gets lost in translation. 
right? And then people on the research side do not always make it, make it easy, right? So there's hundreds of articles that come out every year in hundreds of journals. And it becomes really difficult and overwhelming for those of us focused on teaching to really winnow through and find what's the most applicable stuff, what's the most useful stuff that, that's really well established that, that I can use today. So in the, in the teaching and in the writing that I do today, that's been my focus. And you know, that winnowing through that, that frameworks for selection idea is one that I also bring to selecting technologies. What am I going to bring into my classrooms, whether face-to-face, -face, online, blended or hybrid? What am I gonna choose and how am I gonna use it? Because I think, and perhaps you'll agree, that we are way beyond the point of, oh my gosh, is there a technology out there that I could possibly use, right? So it's like they grow like mushrooms in the night, all the, all the new things that you can buy, you can use, you can adopt, and they're in your email, and oh my gosh. Um, so there too, it's an embarrassment of riches and one that those of us engaged in teaching really, you know, we, we need strategies to select from. So that's what really gets me excited to share today. And that idea of frameworks, of some guides for, for us to choose what we're going to do and how out of a, a very rich and sometimes crowded field of teaching options and technologies. That's what our time is about today. And our time today is also uh, about kind of, I think, visiting or, or revisiting a set of ideals, all right, that I think are as relevant today as they uh, ever have been, including the, what we'll call, I guess, the before times, right, before uh, the great pivot. So that's actually where I want us to start with our attention today. So if we can actually change slides, and this will be the very first of our technology challenges. All right, so I want us to think about that big grand promise of teaching with technology, very, very broadly defined. We're not gonna split hairs about what counts as technology, what counts as using technology and teaching. And what that is or what that even was since, since our, our pivot took place, right? So here's one that I wanna plant as a kind of a thinking and reflecting question before we go much further today. So we're not gonna do this as a, formal think pair share. This is going to be a little bit more introvert friendly, but I'm going to reserve somewhere between uh, two and four minutes, depending on, on how, we're, how we're doing, to invite you to think about, you know, if we're talking about realizing the promise of what technology is supposed to be able to do for higher learning, what even is that to us? It's, it's probably going to be highly individual, reflect our own experiences, our own focus, and so on. So let's take a few minutes to reflect on this you're on your own. Um, take a few notes if you'd like, or feel free to, to turn to that neighbor and say, what do you think? All right, so I'm going to let you run with this for, for a couple of minutes.
Okay, so let's take a few additional seconds to wrap up our brief thoughts. Now, as you might guess, uh, I'd like to gather just a few, perhaps representative or even, even random ideas. Um, it, it, I think what will work really well is if uh, you'll, you know, if you'd like to offer a few thoughts, uh, put up a hand, I'll pick as many as I can. And uh, you tell me and I'll relay it on the microphone because it's real important for everybody to be able to hear this. Uh, go right ahead, yes. Okay. and the assessment before the faculty and the light went off in my head. And I said, good, this is some aspect I hadn't thought of is technology making life easier for instructors, for the teachers. And she said, no, not necessarily. <laughs> and so um, I, I teach writing and um, we have these wonderful new technologies. And the first thing I think of is, oh, heck, a new technology to learn. And it's overwhelming. So I'm going to be the, I'm going to be Darth Vader here and say, this is the dark side of technology. So that, okay, yell me out of the room. I don't care. Right. So like, like so many things, uh, what, the promise is maybe, I hate to call it labor saving. Is it what we do is, you know, it doesn't always feel that way, but, but that's, what it can be so so yeah there's there's a piece there around the instructor side of what we do in transforming our jobs uh for for better for uh or for not so much okay all right great uh yes okay i'll i'll also relay what you have to say i'll summarize as best i can location Right. So that was something that we looked at in terms of price. People think that going online, like it yeah. uh, means that now you don't have a tag, you're not getting any yeah. Okay, so teaching anatomy, right? That all of a sudden the cost goes down, but it actually doesn't go down. And then something that I added was I think that because we haven't actually taken a look at what we're paying for specifically, so um, in those classes, that's the reason why the online cost doesn't go down. Mm -hmm. We're adding costs on top of costs Okay. All right. So there's a piece about definitely location. So technology was supposed to surmount location. And uh, I think, for example, to, to connect to this idea about uh, location, students learning from, from lots of areas. Um, so my institution serves the Navajo Nation, which is a region about the size of Ireland crosses four states, and it's amazing. And there isn't cell service, let alone, uh, you know, Wi-Fi everywhere in this region. Uh, students during the pandemic visited chapter houses, which are community centers there to access their classes. So there too, there's some complexities. And was it supposed to bring price down at the same time to do, for example, a virtual anatomy lab, um, similar to what you, you're teaching. So, so there's that piece as well. Um, let's have maybe one, one more uh, set of reflections. Okay, uh, yes. Location, you have digital literacy, you have English proficient, proficiency, um, all of those assumptions that may still be creating barriers, whether you're online or not. Right, so, uh, okay, so other, other barriers, uh, things like language proficiency, right? So can technology help surmount those? Is it is it going to accentuate those? All right, so these are all, um, complex and important reflections to keep in mind, sort of in the proverbial back of the mind, as we think about the techniques and ideas and concepts for today. So when I think about this too, I mean, I, I don't know that I, I kind of took this on as in a, such a complex way. I don't maybe have some of the same sense of nuance as some of these, uh, these comments uh, that, have, that have come forth already. But here's kind of a distillation of what I've seen over the last 
say 10 to 15 years. And what I tend to hear from faculty, we say, what was this supposed to do for us and for our students? So up on the screen here, I'm gonna just be listing a couple of these and describing them one after the other. So yeah, this piece of access. So I remember, and maybe you do too, um, over sort of in the early days of things like MOOCs and massive open online courses and so on, going to conferences and there being so much excitement about how, not just within the United States, but globally, internationally, as long as you can get to that technology, if you can overcome that first initial barrier, you have access to so much higher learning that previously was, was really restricted. Or even you can take advantage of self-teaching, tap into all that knowledge that's online. So supposed to have a promise of access, more individuals can get to it. Uh, so we've got that. There's also this piece too. I mean, I'm, I'm about as data driven as a person can be being a lifelong, uh, you know, career long research psychologist. So this attraction of better outcomes, more learning and faster. So whatever we can measure about learning that we're gonna see more and better when technology is in the mix. Okay, so that was part of the, the promise as well, the ideal. The idea that it would be engaging. So there's something like a fun or an engagement factor here. And you know, I, I wanna be, I wanna just kind of qualify here and not kind of wander into what I think is an outdated concept. I'm just gonna come out and say it. The idea of the digital native, the idea that, oh, you know, college kids uh, are, <laughs> they, they want technology everywhere. They breathe it like oxygen. They have no bad feelings about it. I mean, first of all, we're assuming that our students are quote unquote kids in this narrow age range and demographic, which they are not, right? And we are also assuming that they, they have just uncomplicated, overwhelmingly positive, I want it everywhere attitudes about technology, which if you talk to them in some depth, as I have with many students in that kind of younger age demographic, you realize they really don't. That said, it is true that there, you can create fast paced activities, introduce novelty, do things more quickly with technology. And that can perhaps add to an engagement factor, which is what we wanted all along. And then lastly, this one that is so close to my heart uh, and kind of related to the second point here on the slide, it enables us to put into practice this massive and still growing body of research on how people learn. So research on mind and brain about how people learn. And some of this stuff, some of the points you'll see in, in the talk later on, these, this is knowledge that's been around in some cases for decades, in some cases it's brand new. But especially in the case of the older research, we didn't always have a good and practical way to put it into place. And we certainly couldn't put it into place in a variety of modalities like hybrid, like fully online and so forth. So they, these, are, these are the things that we're kind of hoping that we move towards as we look at frameworks to make those choices. So here's where I, I'd like to um, transition us into the first framework I want to share with you. And this is one that it really grew out of the work I did when I was writing the book Minds Online. Right. And that's a, a book about how to choose and use technologies and how to set up online courses in ways that really do tap into and mesh with some of the best established principles of learning. Right. So, uh, and it's a little bit of a Trojan horse, too. I'll just kind of admit here for, for sharing a lot about my science and cognitive psychology and things that I think are really cool in it. So um, when I got the opportunity to write this, though, I had this rather overwhelming task of saying, well, how do I kind of divide and conquer this huge field, overwhelming even for me as specialists, and kind of get find ways we can get our arms around this and provide an entree into the field. And as I, I thought of that, I hit on this framework which has resonated, I, I've now seen it resonating with quite a few faculty, which is narrowing down, kind of zeroing in on three key kind of areas of cognition. So things the mind does. And so on this slide, uh, I've listed attention, memory, and thinking or thought processes. 
So that's kind of the, the core of, of this idea, this framework, this system. And so I wanna unpack a little bit about each one of these. So with attention, this is, this is one of the first things that, that comes along in, in the psychology of teaching and learning. And it's funny because when I went to go read all the other really classic and really good books and articles about this, very few of them started with this idea of attention. And I say that's kind of weird because as a cognitive psychologist, and now we now have all this research showing that whenever your mind is doing something cool and interesting and challenging, attention is first on the scene. It's like the Forrest Gump of cognition or something like that. I'm still looking for a metaphor. So in order to say, solve a problem. We know that attention gets involved. You have to pick out, well, what's relevant and salient about this situation? In order to form new memories, to really establish new learning, it's almost always the case that you have to be paying focus, focused attention. So to me, that made sense. Now, in this talk, where you know, due to time and focus and so on, we're not gonna uh, get too much into the technicalities of attention. But I think it's great to start with that idea that no matter what students are doing, you wanna be sure that you've hooked them in as far as their attention. You have to obtain and maintain focus. Now, the second point, of course, memory. This is the bread and butter topic for any cognitive psychologist. We have researched this arguably more than anything else. We have theories going back decades of how we uh, take in, maintain, establish and retrieve knowledge in mind and in the brain, all right? So, and tomorrow's workshop, we're gonna take a very deep dive into this, this topic of memory. But that said, I always have to mention this qualifying point that by no means am I saying or trying to imply that memory or the dreaded M word memorization is like the sole aim of what we're trying to accomplish in the classroom. Okay, that's a, there, there are lots of good reasons to pay attention to this. We now know, for example, that when students know more and have more firmly established knowledge of key facts in an area, they're better able to reason like experts in that discipline, right? So it's not like, which one do you want, one or the other? These two things do tend to go hand in hand. And I think we can all agree as experts that there's key facts in our disciplines that students really, you know, they're not gonna get much further if they have to dive for their phone every time they need those key facts. So with that, we know so much about how memory works. Great thing that we can tap into. So still important even in a technological age. But then what do we really want, right? We really want students to develop those thinking skills to be able to apply what they're learning and remembering and, and reading about and experiencing in, in the courses. And with thinking skills, again, we're not gonna get too much into all the technicalities of what we've discovered about how thinking skills work and develop, but um, we can say that there is this definite contrast here between uh, just learning about content and actually practicing those skills. So while it does help, to know more about an area, it doesn't guarantee you're going to develop those, those thinking skills. So for example, my students can, can learn about and read about other people's psychology experiments that they put together in their research, doesn't guarantee that they're gonna be able to design their own and analyze the data at the end of the day, right? And especially if we're talking about skills that transfer. So thinking skills that don't just say, okay, now you see it, now you don't, when we move to the next module, Students almost always need more practice, more hands-on practice than we think that they will, right? And so we'll be touching on later today on a few examples of ways that we can also infuse this into, the, into our curriculum. So attention, memory, and thinking, that's one framework. As you reflect on how your course is put together to say, all right, how do students get an interest in what, what I'm presenting? How do they stay focused? How do they establish the knowledge they're gonna need? How do they practice using that knowledge? So that's this, this framework. And I wanna present to transition us now into an example that, that ties into that middle category, memory, right? The topic that's, that's so close to my heart. And this is a neat one because I think it's a real success story. It's a success story in 
bringing theory to practice, disseminating it widely, and marrying it with uh, the affordances of what technology can do. Now, this is the case of retrieval practice, right? So I know this is always a little, little risky, but I'm gonna ask for a show of hands, don't worry, you're not gonna get called on. But how many individuals in this room today have some familiarity with what retrieval practice is, heard of it a little bit, okay? All right, good, I think I'm seeing roughly a third, I'm doing that sort of teacher arithmetic in my head here. So roughly a third of people have. Now here's the thing, um, if I had been giving this talk, say 10 to 12 years ago, when I first did start giving talks like this, there would have been one or two hands at best in a group this size. And it would probably be the person with the instructional design certificate that they just earned and somebody from the psych department. So, uh, so what is retrieval practice and, and how, how is it that it's gotten to be so well recognized and even more so um, every, with every passing day? So retrieval practice refers to the process of effortfully pulling information out of memory, all right? So when I say, put the book away, put my prompt away and say, do I actually remember this? That's what I'm engaged in retrieval practice. And it produces something called the testing effect. So it's also got that little moniker. And the testing effect is the advantage in memory that you get when you do engage in that active retrieval practice. So we have found through a huge range of studies, not just a couple here and there, but a stack of studies, that when you engage in active retrieval practice, it produces a better improvement in terms of just memory, better improvement than anything else you can do with that same time, just full stop incredibly effective. And of course, this can take the form of sitting and taking a formal test, but it, it, once you know about it, you can kind of see some other examples from everyday life. So uh, I'll offer one uh, of me using, actually finally using retrieval practice to benefit myself. So I have worked at Northern Arizona University for 22 years, right? So 22 years. On day one, I was issued a nine digit ID number, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, okay, it's on my card, I stick that card away. And every time I had to fill out a form for the next 20 years, I pulled it out and I just copied it up. And I never ever learned it. Well, until I bought an expensive permit to the fancy new parking garage attached to my building. And I have to dial in my number in the first couple of days, I'm, you know, I'm fumbling. I'm like, you know what, I need to remember this. So I put the card away, gave it my best shot. I got it a little wrong the first couple of times. Now I know that nine digit number, right? After a few mere minutes of retrieval practice. So retrieval practice in particular, we found it in this wide variety of studies, blows doors off of what for many students is their go-to study move, simply because they've never heard of this principle. So for many students, when they say, I'm going home and studying, they mean rereading, right? And, and we're not talking here about like going back and deeply interrogating a text. We're talking about the highlighter fest. Okay, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it. And again, it's, it's through no fault of students. This produces this sort of false sense of security as you do that, but it's unlikely to give you much of a kind of return on the time and effort you put in. So that's been established. Now on the screen here, I have a, a reference to just one of, again, many articles that talks about this particularly good one called The Critical Importance of Retrieval for Learning published by uh, Jeffrey Karpicki in Science. So that's one of many things you can read if you'd like to kind of put this to the test and see, if, see what we've looked at. So very powerful principle. Um, and we also found that these gains last a long time too. So it's not like, oh, this gives an improvement in the 20 minutes it takes to finish this psychology experiment and leave. This lasts for months, if not years. So very exciting. It's even got its own website, believe it or not. So retrievalpractice.org, great place you can go to learn uh, high-tech and low-tech ways to put this into practice in a, in a real range of, of classrooms and situations and settings. Now, what, is it, what does it actually look like? Well, it's 
for a group like this, it's not hard to imagine <laughs> using some old familiar favorites, most likely, how we can uh, increase or even introduce this into our classes as a way of reinforcing foundational knowledge. So I keep thinking I'm going to have to drop Quizlet out of my slide deck because <laughs> it's been around for so long. Uh, it's kind of a old flashcard application. But then my students come to me and they say, uh, oh, you know, we made a Quizlet and we shared it with each other. And I go, oh my gosh, this is still really, really relevant. Okay, so Quizlet, a way for students to actually take control of this themselves and take advantage of this principle. So you, up on the screen, we have a little icon for Quizlet. And we also have a, a little visual reminder of Kahoot. I'm going to do the other, you know, show of hands. How many people have used it? Have kind of looked? Yes, we love Kahoot because it does one thing. And it does it really, really well, right? So you can use it to bring in the, the gamified quizzes. Now, because Kahoot also really privileges speed and you have to be able to read quickly and respond quickly, I don't like to give points based on your Kahoot score. Um, but students use, you know, pseudonyms, fake names, and we do it as just a, a low stakes participation activity. And it's great because, it, you know, you can have students back home remote playing against students who are in the classroom in the same time, then you can post it for students who are asynchronous. So it's got that flexibility as well. Um, and even alternatives like, you know, your poll everywhere and things like that used in this way can be retrieval practice. So it really goes together with simple accessible technologies like peanut butter and jelly. And, you know, don't worry about the text on the screen here, but I've got a visual placeholder for um, even the basic um, capabilities of a learning management system to administer quizzes, which I like to do in a repeatable way. And this is something that's also been real popular with a lot of folks uh, across fields. So what you do is you set up a database of questions, say for a given module. I like to, if I can, dump in ones from the publisher, so let them do a lot of the work. Students, uh, before we go over that material, before we start on it, they are uh, supposed to finish this, this reading quiz before they come in, and it's going to sample out of this database, and I tell them, take it as many times as you want and keep the highest grade. Oh my gosh, I'm giving away the store, right? But no, what I'm doing is creating an incentive for them, again, to do their own retrieval practice. And they say, well, why, why are we getting to do it so many times, and why are we doing it before we go over it in class? Oh, remember how quizzes are for learning? Well, I'm putting that into practice. And the incentive is there, so it's also safe for them to even try it again after they get 100 points. And I, that's a great question to ask, too. Why would you take this once you've also already gotten a perfect score? Oh, is it so I can learn from it? Absolutely. And then we can spend the class time, of course, doing more in-depth and application activities and not on the slide fest of points that were in the reading. Okay, so that's what it can look like. And so I hope that sparks some ideas of your own. But I do, here's where we also want to acknowledge something else about retrieval practice. And activities like this, is there is a little bit of a catch, right? A little bit of a catch. And it's this, that it does take really focused effort to do one of these quizzes, right? More so than it does to watch me cycle through the giant slide deck. It takes engagement and it takes effort and it takes a little bit of, it's sometimes it's a little bit bruising if you didn't do as well as you, you thought you would the first time around. So in a way, it does require students to put forth a little bit more motivation and effort, which in my experience, they're very willing to do, but that has to be there because the best design things that we design, that we decide to do with technology and in our teaching do absolutely no good if no one finishes them, right? So there's that piece as well, this motivation and self-regulation component. And so I would put to you, I, I don't find this a controversial statement, perhaps you do, but this idea that motivation, self-regulation are more important today for our higher learners uh, than they have been before. So that this is kind of a trend. And by self-regulation, again, we're not going to split hairs about what we mean exactly, but that ability to say, hey, here's an effective study strategy. 
I know it, I'm gonna identify it, I'm gonna commit to it, and I'm gonna follow through on it, okay? So before we, we talk a little bit more about how those phenomena work, self-regulation, motivation, eliciting effort from everybody in the classroom. I want us to consider this. So this is another like really brief, think about it. Um, I'll gather a few impressions here. So let's, I'm gonna set maybe about two minutes for us to think about this statement. Do you agree with it? And if you do, why do you think this is the case? The motivation and self-regulation are if anything more important than they ever have been before. Where's the second line? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna gather uh, once again, a couple kind of randomly chosen thoughts here. And uh, we're actually gonna have the microphone circulate so that our, our folks um, in Zoom and everybody in the room will, will uh, have full access to the comments. All right, so we have uh, a point over, over here. Well, we let's let's bring the mic. Uh, unless it projects five rooms down. Here we go. So, what do you think? So, I put the put myself in this question, mm -hmm. not just as a student, but as a teacher. Yeah. And I am very motivated to complete my grading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I am because I yeah. once I have that list yeah. done, I'm done. Huh? Yeah. yeah. But it's the self regulation. Before I could just isolate myself in a room and there was no distractions. Yeah. Now yeah. I have to electronically isolate myself because yeah. as far as self-regulation, if my phone pings, it doesn't matter if it's an ad for shoes or mm -hmm. one of my students. Mm -hmm. I, I stop my grading and I get distracted. Mm -hmm. And that's why for me, the self-regulation has a whole different component yeah. now that I'm online almost 100% of the time. I, I love it. And I love that it's too, it's not like an us versus them, the digital natives versus other people. It's like, this is all of us. This is the human condition. And let's have one more. Actually talk loud. <laughs> My name, um, I think that the self-regulation is really important for students, especially since there's so much more online. Yeah. Um, if it's a face-to-face -face class, you can mm -hmm. walk in and the, and the professor can say, we're having that quiz today, this 10% mm -hmm. of your grade. And you go, thank God it showed up. Mm -hmm. But if you're online, those dates pass. Mm -hmm. And it really is important for an instructor to let the students know you, you, you have to keep track of the dates because yeah. nobody else is going to do them for you. Okay. Um, and that you have um, when quizzes opens when qu quizzes okay. close that they're all in that calendar in my case in canvas uh -huh. uh, it doesn't hurt to kind of remind mm -hmm. but the push is really on the student to keep track of those dates it wasn't so bad if they had one online mm -hmm. class but with everything we did mm -hmm. in the pandemic and put so much online yeah uh, just a lot my students really were having trouble 
trying to go it's like what day is this is this a second mm -hmm. tuesday or you know what <laughs> yeah yesterday what is it okay and, and i i since there's lots of comments and let's kind of carry those into our coffee hours and so on because clearly we've hit on something here and i which warms my heart again I swear this comment is not a plant because <laughs> this is exactly the types of things that I reference when people, you know, I, I don't agree with kind of the undercurrent of like, oh, Zoom class is inherently bad and online is inherently, it's not, of course it isn't. I've seen amazing things accomplished online, remote, uh, but there are these special considerations. We've, we're in this environment where is it shoes? Is it a tornado, squirrel? Oh my gosh, us and them. And yeah, absolutely. When we are, I mean, in, for students who are just coming into college, it kind of carries over from what they did in high school for many of them. I know I have to show up at this time and oh, thank goodness I did because now I know about the quiz and there's social facilitation. I can look around and see what are other people doing. Those things are more challenging online. And for students who are prone to procrastination, which you know is not necessarily them individually, can be the situation, they there's an out of sight, out of mind quality. If this is not going well and I'm feeling really challenged or threatened by this class, I can leave the laptop closed. Not a good idea in the long term, but I can do it in the short term. So in and in classes that are self-paced, so like on the screen here. It says students are learning in more self-paced, challenging environments and modalities. So just generally referencing this big ball of issues that happens that a little bit more, maybe a lot more is on them in many ways. And this piece that's fired up so much in my current work that students really do need this to benefit maximally from what we know is really beneficial stuff for them. Stuff like retrieval practice, but also other high impact practices that do take more effort and might make them more uncomfortable and do require them to, to be perhaps more flexible and to break out of what they've done before. So here again, without this piece, what we design is not gonna have the impacts that it could. So it makes a lot of sense than to also be thinking about motivation. Now, when I went to write Minds Online, I will tell you, there nowhere in that original plan and proposal was I gonna talk about motivation because that was out of my lane as a cognitive psychologist, right? I'm over here thinking about memory and so on. But I hit this point in the book where I said, we can't talk about this stuff unless we also link it to what is going to carry students through. And to, to start challenging that idea that either you're motivated or you're not, or you just want it or you don't, which is not how psychologists think about motivation at all. And to tap into some more established ideas that can help us help students um, become more self-regulated and to put in the effort where we know it's going to benefit them. So on the screen here, we have uh, a little refresher on some of the classic research on motivation, things that are, are really our greatest hits in the psychology of motivation, which I think all teachers should know about. And frankly, should be thinking about as we put together our plan, our plan not just for what are students gonna learn and how, but what is gonna carry them through. So of course, when we think of this classic stuff, we think of first incentives, right? Uh, you say, well, why do people do things? Well, there's a reward. And, and so it ties into that, that idea. And so, of course, the extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation concept. Probably most of us have seen this in one form or another. And, and it's a good one, this idea of like, all right, people do things, our students do things, partly because, hey, there's points or I want to get this job and, and so on, but also for the intrinsic value that I'm passionate about this subject. I want to do this with what I'm learning. And, and I would caution us, don't oversimplify it too much. It's easy to go, oh, I only want intrinsic and intric extrinsic is bad and, you know, points will spoil everything. It's, it's a little bit more complicated in the real world, right? There's, there's things we do, um, partly for an end, extrinsic reason, but are part of a bigger picture at intrinsic motivation. So like, you know, a student may say, I don't want to take statistics. I don't want to be in this class. I have no love for this but I do wanna take this, finish my degree in psychology and go on to be a school psychologist to help kids. 
So that's all right to have those kind of motivations chained together, but it's good to think about these, these two sides as we plan our teaching. There's also another famous one, self-determination theory. And this one I love because it talks about the environment for motivation. So again, it's not just on the individual to be motivated or not, but what conditions can we set? And so the researchers who work in this uh, argue that there's three conditions under which people put forth effort. It's what motivation is all about. They do it when they feel competent, right? Yeah, I can do statistics. I'm, pre I'm getting pretty good at this. When I have some relatedness, kind of a social component, I, I'm working with my group. I like my group. Everybody's giving me compliments and autonomy. So maybe instead of saying, well, you have to do a project about this in the lab and analyze it, say maybe you can choose your own project and have some, some discretion over the approach and the topic. And lastly, academic self-efficacy. So self-efficacy in general, another really uh, oldie, goodie, um, it's, it's kind of the little engine that could principle. So we put forth effort, not just when we want to get towards a goal, but when we can feel and see that the effort we're putting in is getting us there, right? Because I can want something really, really, really badly, but if nothing I'm doing is getting me there, why would I put forth the effort? And so this definitely plays out in academic con uh, context too. When students feel and see and believe that, yeah, if I put this study time in, if I do this quiz, if I finish this project, I will get there, then of course, they're more likely to put in that effort for us. So those are, again, the classics, but there's a few others on the horizon that I think are particularly relevant, especially when we're talking about technologies because it's inspired by one of the most powerful technologies around, which is gaming, right? So, uh, and digital and non-digital games have a lot of things in common, but of course, who, who could miss the influence of games in, in life today? So up on the screen here, we have a, a little screenshot of a, a great book about this, not by a psychologist, so you know it has to be good for me to recommend it, called Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal, who's a game designer herself. And she talks about some of the features that make games game-like and therefore extremely motivating. Like she points out that the number of the hours that people have put in playing just one game, I think it's Halo, is more hours than the amount of time that Homo sapiens has been on Earth. So you'll have to check that fact out for yourself, but wow, there is something that they have hit on to get that out of that time and effort out of people. And so she and other researchers have, have a, a kind of a, a little idealist here, which we can adapt to. So the, the things that make games game, like it's not always the, the violence or the animations or the, the, the points and so on, but features that encourage so-called flow states, those are states when you've kind of lost track of time. And if you've ever played a really good game, you look at the clock and you know what we're talking about, but this can be in other situations as well. For me, it's cooking. I forget what time it is and, and I'm just really into that activity. Flow states, if you're again, are not magic. They tend to happen when people get a lot of feedback, get feedback immediately. And, uh, it, and when they feel like it's sort of this Goldilocks sweet spot of difficulty, not too hard, not too easy. Good games are also failure friendly. <laughs> so there's been a lot of great uh, dialogue lately about how our students in order to succeed and thus to support them in their success, they also have to be willing to fail and, and games definitely do this. Uh, you jump in really quickly with that quick start, you get multiple attempts, oh, you, you died right away. Well, let's try it again. How many of our learning environments, how many of our technologies that we implement have this quality to them? And McGonagall, too, point out something very unexpected to me, which is that these good games like Halo have a real sense of mission and a narrative and a backstory. And that hooks people into, and it's another one that highly motivating teachers, it's like their secret weapon. Of not just, okay, we're here, you're going to do this, and here's why, but we are on a mission to do something and accomplish something very, very important. And always knowing where you stand. Right, I, I wouldn't play a game if I had to wait a month to know if I, if I lived or died in that game. So as quickly as you get, yeah, I know where I stand. I know where I stand globally on the one game that I play. I'm not gonna say what it is, but 
I know <laughs> where, where I rank in different aspects of this game. So those are things we can borrow. And a couple of other really practical points, uh, of course, coming back to that idea of assessments. That's where, especially those extrinsic motivators are the most relevant. Uh, the, the tests, the assignment, the, the assignments, the quizzes. And we are really converging in pedagogy, getting away from that two midterms final and the giant killer project, right? And breaking it down. And this is doable with technology in a way it never was before, right? So early and often, fast and frequent, like it says on the screen here. So instead of just having the exam, I mean, you can keep that exam, but let's have something else week by week. And this is one of the things that can tap into that self-efficacy principle after all, right? So if I can see that my efforts are paying off, they're doing what she said that they would do every single, every single week, I'm more likely to keep at it. And then, you know, let's not forget about intrinsic motivation, of course. So none of this makes it so that we can't spark learning in other ways to create that interest. Now, I would encourage folks, and I always do, to stay out of that kind of trap of, well, students are either interested in X or they're not, right? I think we could all think back on classes we took because we had to, and we got there and we found out, wow, I, I really am interested in this. And so reflecting on the conditions that created that. Uh, emotions such as surprise, curiosity, other things uh, that are tools used by really skilled instructors who are great at, at creating this. So in our, our last brief segment here, I wanna get into some uh, concrete ways to address and kind of bring these things together into engaging students in practice, that practice that is so necessary to become the skilled practitioner, the, the disciplinary expert with those habits of minds and those skills that, that are characteristic of an expert. And what does it look like? What are some examples? And the idea here for, is not necessarily to take all these wholesale and do them, but to use them to spark your own creativity. So engaging students in practice. So when I went to go look for um, different applications, and I'm always on the lookout for different applications, programs, and tools that do this, what really strikes me is they're, they're mostly disciplinary specific, and many of them are created by faculty for other faculty in that same discipline. So uh, correct me in the hall if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's like one application, you just bring it in and students can now quote unquote think. It tends to be a lot more, more specific than that. Um, I think of things like Sniffy the Rat. So I've got a little visual placeholder up on the screen here. Sniffy the Rat, uh, legions of psychology students have now used this to learn about something that's, that's really hard in my discipline. Uh, how things like classical conditioning and operant conditioning work, it is really dense on the page and confusing. Uh, we used to actually um, have rodent labs in psych departments where students would train actual rats, but you know, rats bite and they smell and they're high maintenance and you can't just reset them and start over. But this uh, walks students through that same process of training a rat on a very long, realistic um, learning curve to learn about those principles. Cog lab, another little placeholder here for something I use in my discipline. It helps get around this issue in cognitive psychology that we're teaching about these classic research paradigms that are just surreal when you try to read about them. You're saying, okay, so people are remembering something and there's different colors and there's timing. What is going on in this? And this allows students to go through those classic paradigms from the perspective of a research participant and then actually to work with the data. So it's, it's like a lab, it's like a simulation all in one. And of course, we are right here now in the home of <laughs> where there's a wonderful suite of freely available uh, simulations for STEM uh, disciplines was, was born. Um, so there's simulations, a pet project uh, here uh, depicted on the screen. Students can explore with interactive um, animations and diagrams and simulations everything from biochemistry to principles of physics. So what a great way to make that accessible and for students to be able to do it as many times as they need to. Now it's also the case 
that you can go super high tech with this, Right. So even things like immersive simulation, what's shown here on the screen is a little shot from our immersive VR for OCHEM that was invented and, and tested at my institution. Now, immersive technology like VR, I think the jury's still out on the best ways to use this, but we felt that its affordances were a really good match for what students do in organic chemistry. Right, they're working with these spatial configurations and they need to really think in these complex visual ways. And it's about molecules, which you can't even really directly observe anyway. So what a great way to have students come in. And we, we created these assignments where they would work through concepts from the courses um, using these simulations. And we did find in some research that, that came out last year, we found that when students had access to this as part of their OCHEM courses, in particular, students who are first-generation college students had, had, were more likely to pass the class and had better overall grade distribution. So we're still you know, looking at exactly why that occurred, what was beneficial. But when you match the tech to the demands of the discipline in the course, you can see some advantages. And sometimes those are not distributed you know, randomly. They are um, helping the students that we are there to give access to. But I don't wanna imply that it's only these really, really high tech things that are gonna take years to set up is the only way that you can create a simulation with technology that's effective. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, one last one that I, I can't take credit for. This is my uh, good colleague, Rebecca Mashter, one of the creators, by the way, of the podcast T for Teaching. Um, she was telling me about this once, and I thought it was just delightful, so I'm going to share it with you. So this is part of her uh, online uh, website creation course designed for the web, which is about making beautiful functional websites, but also it's about pre-professional skills, like interfacing with clients who don't always know exactly what they want, right? So she gives people an assignment of make a simulated website, and we're going to make it as realistic as we can. Um, and she gives them a little client with a profile, but this client also has a persona. And in the perfect touch of realism, what she did is each of these clients has an email address that she makes up. So instead of sending my work to Professor Mashter, I'm sending it to busybeelady47 at Gmail. And she'll actually play a role as students give, uh, give intermediate pieces of this design and so on. And she says that every now and again, students will come to her and actually complain and say, my client is being unreasonable. And she will say, that's me. <laughs> and like any good simulation, it's, if they really blow it, you can try, she'll write back as herself and say, okay, let's try that one again, right? So even something as incredibly simple that we don't even maybe think of as technology anymore, email and an email address can be used if it's targeted in this way to have students rehearsing and honing the skills that, that they need as professionals and as experts. So this is the stuff that I think is so exciting, right? When we have those frameworks for, for the cognitive processes, for the motivational dynamics that are going to get our students returning to our material, engaging in it, um, developing knowledge and using that knowledge, those are, those are the principles that I, I think can, can launch us into the next phase of teaching with technology. So on the screen here, kind of coming full circle, encouraging you to be thinking about how are our choices going to mesh with these frameworks and also keep us moving towards those goals of access for everybody, better outcomes, often as possible, engagement, getting students putting in the time and the effort that we know that they need to grow and that really fit with the evidence that we find most compelling and relevant. That's what we wanna see. And that's my invitation to you. As we continue to go through this clearly vibrant <laughs> and anticipated event, um, to keep that purpose in mind, have that vision with us, right? What do we want our choices to be? Because it is up to us many times. How are we going to use the technology? Not just because it's there or we think it's cool or somebody bought it, but because it is gonna to tie to our core purposes and how we're gonna put that in service for our students who are after all persistent, deserving 
and just all around amazing people. I know my, I'm, I'm missing mine already. So I want you to be thinking of these questions, this invitation, which of these principles map onto the needs of your students in your discipline? What technologies, techniques, approaches will you use to put them into practice? So I thank you so much for our time together today. I know I've enjoyed it. And I really hope that you will join me for our Q&A later this afternoon and for our memory-focused workshop tomorrow morning. So thank you very much.